Stanford University. Lecture 10 of Stanford TS 193P, spring of 2020, is all about demo. All demo all the time today. This demo is mostly about presenting views on screen. We already know how to do that somewhat. For eaches will bring views on, on screen and off screen. Also, if else's inside of view builders, those make views come and go. But now we're talking about large groupings of views, views that might take over the entire screen, views that might be driven by their own MVVMs, right? Having their own view models, which we have not seen an app yet <clears throat> that has multiple view models, but we're gonna see that today. We're gonna to take emoji art to the next level. It's gonna have multiple view models. And of course, most large programs have many view models. As usual, these things that I'm showing you in the demo are just intended to introduce this functionality to you in context. That's why we do memorize an emoji art. So you have a context to see this functionality introduced to you. Still no substitute from going to the documentation, reading about things, try to understand them. That's a lot of why we ask you to do the homework. So you have to really figure out how to use these things. Here's a list of what we're going to do today. I'm not going to go over this, but just for quick reference, you can always go back and say, huh, what was I supposed to have learned in this demo? It's a very long list, as, as you can see, and a lot of very important things in this list as well. So without further ado, let's get started. This demo is going to be all about putting views on screens in different ways, alerts, popovers, etc. But before I dive into that, I want to show you one little thing that we could have done last time that I think is worth showing just so you understand these property wrappers a little bit better. Now you remember that we wanted to initialize this chosen palette using our documents default palette, but we couldn't do that here because this observed object is part of what's being initialized and so we can't during initialize do it here. Now it turns out we can't really do it in an init either. So if we had an init that took the document and just said self.document equals that document, then unfortunately we can't even do this right here. And you'd think maybe we could do that because now we have the document, we can just set our chosen palette. But the thing is here, we are in the middle of initializing and this needs to be initialized. I'm kind of surprised this even compiles, although I could imagine a cool feature where this would compile and actually work, but it doesn't. What we have to do instead here in our init is initialize the actual variable being created by this state, which if you'll remember what that variable is, it's underbar chosen palette. And this underbar chosen palette is of type state. It is this state struct. That's what this line of code actually creates. So we can initialize it by creating a state. And in fact, we're going to create a state that whose wrapped value is the value we want. So this document's default palette. This is a way to initialize your state in your initializers by setting this struct directly. Hopefully you don't have to do this very often. And I'm imagining this is going to be more elegant ways to do it in the future of Swift. But this really does show you what this is creating. It's creating this underbar var, which is one of these. So we don't really need our on appear. Our on appear worked fine there actually, but this is more of a kind of an educational thing about what's going on with these property wrappers. And later in the quarter, I hope to actually, maybe we'll create our own property wrapper and then we'll really understand these things. But in the meantime, this should help you, help you understand it a little better. Let's dive in now to what we actually want to build, which is a palette editor. So right now I've got these palettes right here and I can choose between them, but I can't change them. Can't add emoji here, can't remove emoji, can't change the name of this faces thing. So I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to edit them. And I'm going to do that by providing a little icon right here next to the name of the palette. And when you touch on that icon, it's going to bring up some UI that lets you add and remove emojis, change the name, etc. Essentially a palette editor. Let's get started by putting a little icon in here. Now, I went into SF symbols over here and I looked around trying to decide what would be a good icon here that would help people understand what 
touching on it would do. And I, I kind of landed on a keyboard because most of what they're going to be doing is using a keyboard, emoji keyboard, to add more emoji here. So I thought that might be good. You know, when I get into user testing and doing focus groups, we find out people are like, what's that keyboard? I have no idea what that is. And we might then change it to something else. When you're building a UI, you know, you can't assume that you're going to see the world exactly the same way as your users. So you have to be able to be uh, adaptable to what your users actually understand about how your app works. But we're going to start with the keyboard. So I'm going to add a little keyboard right there, keyboard image, right after the name. And that's going to be really easy to do. Here's where our name is. Here's where that plus minus stepper thing is. I'm just going to say image system name. Use the keyboard. Again, this keyboard is something I looked up in SF symbols. And I'm going to also make it large. So I'm going to do this image scale dot large. Simple enough to add this little image. There it is right there. It's on every one. And when I touch on this, I want some UI to come up that lets me edit this palette. So how do we do that? How do we make it so that touching on something causes some UI to come up? I'm going to use a popover in this case. We're going to be showing lots of different ways to bring things up, but I'm going to do popover to start. So popover is just like a little rectangular area that will appear, and it'll kind of point to the thing that brings it up. So we're just going to be our little keyboard icon that brings it up. So it's going to point at that little keyboard icon so that when it's up, this user can remember, oh, yeah, I clicked on that little keyboard icon. That's how this little UI, this view uh, came up. So how do we make a popover up here? We just go here to the view we want it to point to when it comes up, which is our image. And we say popover. Popover has four different ways to bring it up here. Two of them involved passing it a binding to an identifiable, and that identifiable is going to kind of identify what thing you want to show in the popover. But a lot of times in a popover, we're showing the same thing. Like in our case, we always show a palette editor. That's all it shows. So we can use one of these two popover things, is presented right here. And this is presented versions take a binding to a bool, and that bool says whether that popover is currently showing or not. Let's use this one right here. We need to give it a binding to a bool. We know how to do bindings now. We create our own state. So I'll make a little private state here. I'll call it show palette editor. And it's a bool. It's going to start out false. In other words, I don't want the palette editor showing when I, my, this view first comes up. And I just provide a binding to that, which is dollar show palette editor. Remember, dollar on a state is a binding to this value of the state. And this bool is now going to be shared between the popover and us. Now, who's going to do what? Well, I'm going to set this to true whenever I want this popover to appear. And when the popover is up, if the user taps somewhere else outside the popover, it's going to set this back to false. And then it'll disappear. So we're going to be talking to each other through this bool right here, this Boolean value. And then the content, this is just like anything else that has content here. We're just providing a view. It's probably a view builder, in fact. And here our view is that we want to present is our palette editor. So we're going to have to create our own little view here to edit palettes. Let's do that. Easy to do. Make some space down here. And we'll say struct palette editor. It's a view. That means it has var body, which is some view. And for now, I'm just going to have it be a text that says palette editor, because that's what this thing is. Now, you might think, OK, we got it. Pop over. Yep, let's do it. Let's run. We should be able to tap on uh, our image somehow and see this. Here we go. Tap. Oh, I don't see any change. Tap, tap, tap. That's because we never set this show palette editor bool to true. It's always false. So that means that popover is always never showing. So the popover is doing exactly the right thing. Remember, this is declarative UI. We're just declaring that a popover should appear. This should appear in a popover when this is true. But we never set this to true. That's easily enough done, though. On tap gesture of this image, self.show palette editor equals true. So when you tap on this keyboard right here, I'm going to set that to true. 
and we've declared that this popover should appear. When that happens, we just work. There we go, ready? Boop. There it is, our palette editor. So I tapped on that, I set it to be true, and so that popover is declared to show when that thing is true. And similarly, when I click anywhere else outside of there, boop, the popover sets that variable back to false. So that's how we're, again, communicating with each other. And see the little triangle at the top of the popover? That is showing the user what they touched on to cause this popover to appear. And you can set the allowed directions of that arrow, and that somewhat controls where your popover is allowed to come up. The system's gonna try and fit the popover and obey the arrow directions that you want. By the way, popovers are pretty much an iPad thing because there's really not a lot of room on an iPhone, but we're gonna see that the iPhone adapts and still can show a popover, but it doesn't show it as a popover, it just uses full screen. We'll see that in a little bit. Okay, so now we should be able to edit any of these palettes that we want. Before we get any farther here though, I want to make this popover quite a bit bigger. You can see it's small. It's sizing itself to fit our content, which is actually good. That's a cool feature of popover. And we could put some padding around here. But instead of just putting padding, I want to make some space. So as I build my UI, you're going to get a better idea of what it's eventually going to look like. Making space, making this larger, we could, again, try and do it by just put some padding around it. That would make it a little bit bigger. But instead, I'm going to make the entire palette, palette editor have a minimum size. We do that with dot frame. We're, we've seen dot frame before, and as I told you before, dot frame has a lot of arguments down here. And we're going to use the min width and uh, min height arguments. So here's min width, uh, maybe 300 wide, and min height, something like 500. That looks like touch. All right, much better. So we got plenty of room to maneuver in here. It might be down the road. Once I get this UI the way I want, I won't require it to have a min width, but I could always leave it in there as well. It depends on what I want my UI to look like. We want to be able to edit this palette. So let's make sure we can transfer this palette into this editor so that it can edit it. So to do that, I'm going to have my text palette editor. I'm going to put a little divider. And then I'm going to put text of my chosen palette. Now, I want this chosen palette right here to be the same as this chosen palette up here. So we're going to edit whatever chosen palette we're showing here. To do that, I'm just going to create a binding to chosen palette. Notice I'm giving this the exact same name as I give it in here, which is even the same name that we give it over here. But there's no rule, no law that says this has to have the same name. We could call this palette we're editing if we wanted, something like that. But often we'll name them the same just so people don't get quite confused because we are binding them directly to each other. So they are essentially all the same thing. And so we can use this chosen palette down here. Let's put these things into a V stack. And we're seeing that well, we have an error here, missing argument for parameter chosen palette. This is an uninitialized variable in our palette editor. So we have to initialize it, chosen palette. And how do we give a binding to our chosen palette? Dollar chosen palette. And this chosen palette in here is actually a binding itself. It's binding to this state over here, our document view, is that sign state. But we know that if we do dollar on a binding, that that is essentially returning self, okay? The binding itself or a binding to the thing that binding is binding to, either way. And that's exactly what we want here. So we want this binding in that state. So now there are three views all sharing this same value. Let's make sure this is actually working. And I'm going to touch on this keyboard. Whoa, there it is, and it is showing this one right here. Let's go to a different one and touch on it. Woo, it's showing it. So our palette editor definitely got a hold of the palette that is supposed to be editing here. I'm gonna work a little bit on layout of this. I want this thing that says palette editor to really be like at the top, like it's some sort of title or something to my little view instead of having it in the middle like this. So let's let's do that layout really quickly. 
going to make this title have more of a title kind of a font headline and we'll give it some padding around it and then let's make it go to the top by putting a spacer at the bottom that just puts a whole bunch of space in there and let's see what that looks like well, it's getting close a little too much spacing in here we got the padding around this and then we've got the spacing of the b stack it looks like so we can get rid of that But if I'm doing no spacing, maybe I want this thing to have some padding of its own. All right, that is looking pretty awesome. We got our palette editor. This is now the part that is going to be editing the palette. Let's start by working on editing the name of the palette. So right now we're seeing the palette, but I actually wanna see its name here, and then we're going to make it editable so that you can change this from activities to something else if you want it. So how are we going to do that? Well, instead of showing the palette, I wanna show its name. We do that all over the place up here. That's this document palette names right here. I'm gonna copy that code even and put it down here. The problem is we don't have the document down here, right? We have the document up here, but not down here. You might, your first inclination might be, oh, let's create another binding and we'll bind up to here. But that is not how we share view models. This document is our view model. And instead we're gonna share it using environment object. So our document is going to be an environment object and we're gonna do it this way with environment object because we're presenting this thing in a separate view. Anytime we're gonna present something in a popover or any kind of separate view, we want to pass our view model using environment object. And we could pass it as an observed object and then have another argument here to palette editor, but turns out there's a problem. When you do these separate views like popovers and things like that, they get their kind of own world to live in and you have to pass into that world this view model or it won't work right bottom line. So how do we set the environment here? We use this dot environment object. And this is, again, we saw this in the slide. This is how we pass our environment. And in this case, this is just our own document being passed as the environment for this. These environment objects and also outside environment to an extent are really exactly what their name implies an environment in which this view is working. Right? It's, using, it's working in an environment where this is their view model, essentially. So now we have the document. We should be able to get the name out of there. Let's see what that looks like. All right, so this is our activities palette and sure enough, we have it there. Let's try another one. How about our animals? Yeah, animals. Our next step here is to make this animals editable. We want to be able to change this animals to be something else. So how do we make this text editable? We're gonna need a little different view than text for that. We need a text field. A text field takes a little bit different arguments than a text. The first argument it takes is its label. And this should describe what it is that this text field is editing. In our case, this is going to be editing the name of the palette. So we're gonna say palette name. And we'll see in the UI where this label appears. And it depends on the UI. This is going to adapt to uh, Apple TV, Apple Watch, iOS, Mac. It's going to do the right thing here. And then the second argument, the most important argument in text field is called text. And it is a binding to some string that is going to be what's being edited. So this is what the text field is actually editing. So we need, this is gonna be a binding, so I'm gonna make some state here, private var, call my palette name, which is gonna be a string. We'll initialize it to be empty to start. And that's what this text field is gonna do, is edit that. So let's see what this UI looks like with a text field right there instead of a text. There we go. There it is, you can see it says palette name. Now when I touch on it, it starts editing. You can see it brings up the keyboard 
and I could type in hello or whatever I want as the name of my palette. So the label that we saw, palette name, it only showed up when we had nothing in the field, when the field was completely empty. Now, normally that's not going to happen here because when we first bring this up for some given palette, this should probably be pre-filled out with what the current name is. And we'd only see this label if the person delete, 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 and made it go away. And then like, well, what's this field about? They would find out about palette name. But it's pretty obvious if I go to faces and I touch a button right next to it to palette editor and it says faces right here, that that's going to be the name. And in the iOS, we try not to have a lot of extraneous labels and things like that aren't necessary. In this case, definitely not necessary to have this here unless someone deletes it all the way, then they might be like, oh, wait, what is this again? And, the, and then this prompts them for that, which is kind of cool UI. So how do we get this to come up with this saying faces right here instead of being Blake? Well, it's because we're this state, this palette name, the string that we're editing, we initialize it right here to nothingness. So we need to initialize it to be the name of the palette, right? This thing that we have up here that we originally had in that text field. I'm going to do that with on appear. On appear, we're really comfortable doing this, hopefully. I'm just going to set my palette name equal to my document's palette name. And again, I could initialize it in the same way we showed at the beginning of this lecture, but this is a perfectly fine way to do it here. And activities, yep, there it is, and still editable. Can click on it and edit it. Go over here, animals, yep, brings up the keyboard. Notice when it brings up the keyboard, it does scroll the rest of the UI up a little bit so that this is in, not going to be blocked by the keyboard. Very important when we touch to start editing in iOS, especially on an iPhone where space is limited and the keyboard coming up is going to cover up a lot of things. We wanted to scroll up into a place where it's editable. So it automatically does that for us. Now, what if I change this? I'm gonna change this from animals to, let's say, beasts. So I say animals, beasts, and there it is, and it didn't change anything. This still says animals right here, but this says beasts. And I, it still says animals, and now I go, I, it never changed it. How come it never changed it? Well, we, when we're over here editing our text field, we're editing this local state. We're not editing back in our document anywhere. So when this changes, whenever this text field changes, we need to set our document's palette name for that, rename that palette to be that. We do that with another argument to text field it's called on editing changed. And it just takes a little closure. Now this closure has one argument. I call it usually began. This argument is whether the editing changed because editing started, began in the text field or because it ended. So this is the began or ended. So in our case, we only want to update our palette's name or rename our palette when the editing ends. So I'm going to say if not began, then what am I going to do? I'm going to tell my document to rename this palette, the chosen palette, to this name that was just chosen, which is the palette name. Simple as that. I'm just going to rename my palette so my document gets the message that we just edited this thing. So I can still go through here. Now, if I want to rename uh, animals to beasts, I can go to animals, click on it right here. It says animals. We'll back up here. We'll type beasts. We're done editing. We can dismiss the keyboard right here, or we could click away. And it's changing it. See, when we finished editing there, when editing was done happening, it changed. Let's use another text field now to be able to add emojis up here. I want to add emojis to our list. This is so similar. I'm actually going to take this text field right here and copy and paste it and make another text field. This is the add emoji text field. That's its label. Instead of editing the palette name, we're going to 
edit something called emojis to add. And when this one changes, instead of renaming the palette, we're going to ask our document to add emoji, these emojis to add to this palette, chosen palette. And of course, adding emojis to our chosen palette is going to re change our chosen palette. So we're going to re update our own state to do that. And also, let's set our emojis to add here equal to empty because we just added these emojis. We don't really need to leave them in the emojis add. We're not going to add them again. In fact, my add emojis here in my document doesn't allow you to add the same emoji twice. It just moves the emoji to the front of the list if you add it twice. And of course, we need this state as well. So add sign state, private bar, emojis to add. There's a string, we'll start that also, empty as well. So see this? And activities, there it is. So let's click on here to add some emojis. We'll go to the emoji keyboard, all iOS keyboard tab that. This is activities, so let's go over to our activities. Maybe we add some bike riders here and golfers. And there it is, added it right there to our document, no problem. Snow mortar, archery. When we start having a UI though, that's adding multiple things here. And we're even gonna add another section for removing emojis. We don't want them to be kind of open in outer space here, just spaced out with no kind of cohesion to them or no form. And so there is an awesome little view that you can use to give a set of fields like this some form. It's called form. So we're gonna put a form around this. This is what it looks like to put a form around. We put the form right here around these two text fields. And one thing that's nice about form is it was automatically scrollable space that will deal with the fact that we have space at the bottom. So we do not need the spacer anymore there. The form will use all of its space. It's one of these views that takes all the space offered to it. So we don't need a spacer there. Forms also can be divided into sections. For example, we could have a section here, which is our palette name section. And we also don't need padding. Form takes care of all the padding. It's laying out all these things itself. We have another section here. Maybe this section has no title. That's allowed as well. See what this looks like. So we added a form right here, section for the palette name and a section for add emoji. Oh, what kind of form? You've probably seen forms like this before, like even in the settings app that we've seen this kind of look. Now it's a little bit redundant actually to have a section title name here, palette name, when we know that if we edit this down to zero, we're gonna get the palette name there too. So I probably would not have a header with the exact same name as the text field in it. And in fact, I'm not even sure I would make this two separate sections. I might put them both in the same section right here. Makes it a little bit cleaner at UI. You can see it still puts kind of a little special divider line and I can still go and add my emoji right here. But sometimes you do want sections. For example, I'm gonna add a section here to remove emojis and it's going to want to be its own section as you'll see. So let's go ahead and do that. Add a remove emoji section. Section, header, text, remove emoji. And in here, I essentially wanna do a for each on all of my chosen palettes emojis. So I'll map them to strings as we did before. And of course, these are not identifiable. So we'll have to do ID identifiable itself. 
And for each of the emojis in here, we will just put them in a little text like this. And when you tap on them, we'll remove them from our chosen palette. And of course, the for each doesn't lay them out in any particular way. So let's go ahead and put them in, I'll say a V stack for now. I think we can do better than that, but we'll start by putting them in a V stack. So I'm just gonna stack up all my emojis right there and click on them to remove. There we go, there we go. there's all our emojis. Let's try removing some. Let's decide, oh, we don't want the golfer, gone. We don't want the soccer ball, gone. We don't want the surfer, sur snowboarder, gone. The only problem with this emoji thing is it's kind of a yucky UI. Uh, it's To have this in a long list like this, it'd be nicer if it was like in a grid, for example. And we have a grid from Memorize. Let's see if we can use our grid from Memorize in here. It'll make it look better. And it's also gonna help us understand even a little bit more about protocols and don't cares and constraints and gains and all that. Let's start by hopping over to Memorize and grabbing Grid out of there. I'm just going to go over here to Developer here and go to Memorize. Here's Memorize. I'm going to grab Grid and of course we need Grid Layout as well and drag them over here. And we do want to copy the items there. So this is the same Grid we had in Memorize. No changes to it whatsoever. And I'd like to use it instead of this V stack and for each. Remember our grid kind of combines that. So I'm going to say grid, get rid of one of these curly braces. And this would be really nice to do like this. Unfortunately, this is not going to work because our grid doesn't understand how to do this ID self business, right? Our grid requires that everything that's passed to it be identifiable. See, Ident item identifiable. These items have to be identifiable. So let's take a little time out from building our UI and understand how we could change our grid so that it did take an ID argument here that let us specify what key path to use to find the ID. Just like we do here, I wanna pass this. So what is this little thing right here? We've talked about it a few times. It is a key path. It's something that just specifies a certain var to access on an instance of an object. In this case, I'm doing self because these are strings. String.self is the string itself, and that's a good thing to be identifiable. So that works great. So how do we say what this type is? Because if we're going to have this passed as a type here to our ID, we have to say what it is. Its type is key path, and it has two don't cares. One is the kind of object that you are looking for a var on. In our case, this is item. This is the things that's in this array over here, key path item. The second don't care is the return value of it. Now, we really don't care what you use as your identifiable, so our return type is going to be a don't care for us. I'm going to call it ID. I'm going to put it up there. And so that is how we can specify this ID. And now we have this ID. Let's go ahead and set it as a var, hold on to it. So we're going to need a private var that's of type key path item ID. And almost there we just go down here to here's our for each and we will just pass this id our own id bar right there this should work right it's pretty much everything we would need but we have a little bit of a problem we got a constraints and gains problem here it says here generic struct for each requires that id this id conform to hashable which kind of makes sense right what does a for each do looks at all its items and for each of one it builds this view for it which is great but it probably has to keep these items in some sort of dictionary or hash table or something so that it can know which view is associated with them etc so it's perfectly reasonable to expect that id has to be hashable here but id for us is the return value from this key path here that is a don't care 
but evidently we care a little bit about this type ID, this return by from the key path, it's going to have to be hashable. So I'm gonna mark it to be hashable. And just require that this don't care, whatever it is, be hashable. And while I'm at it, I can get rid of item identifiable. That's kind of the whole point is to make it so that our item doesn't have to be identifiable. So we're almost there actually, but we have a problem in that we use this first index matching. Remember first index matching? It's the function that we added to array and to a collection actually that looks something up by its identifiableness. Well, our items are no longer identifiable. I stopped making the identifiable. However, we do have this ID, this key path that we can use on an item to find out an identifiable thing on it, hashable thing. So how are we gonna replace first index of item with using this ID? Well, I'm gonna do first index, a different one called where, and where takes some closure here. And this closure is given each of the things, items in the array. So we'll use the built-in argument, which be dollar zero, and it lets you do something with it and return true when it matches. We want this key path out of our item, and we want to compare this key path out of the dollar zero in the items array to see if they're the same. So here's how you take an item and use a key path to go get the value of the var that that key path is talking about it. You say open square bracket, key path, colon, and the key path. So this expression right here means call this key path var on this item and give it to us. And we're just gonna check to see if that equals dollar zeros key path of that ID. A lot going on here. Hopefully you guys are following this. I would say you don't really have to understand what I just did here to use Swift UI, but if you do, you're really understanding this constraints and gains and what's going on here. But let's take this even one step further. This unfortunately has kind of broken the old way we used to use grid. Now we're forced to do this ID keypad key path. Even if our item is identifiable, we still have to provide this argument. This the argument doesn't default to anything. So let's look how we could take this exact same code that we just modified and change it so it still works with the old world. And this will really get you with the constraints and gains. So I'm going to make an extension to grid. And in this extension, I'm going to require that items be identifiable. So that's only gonna be in this extension that they're identifiable. And then I wanna add a new init where it takes the items just as we did before and does not take that ID argument, but still of course has the view for item. And I wanna be able to call this other init, the one that I made down here with all the right arguments to make this just work. So let's try it. Got the items, got the ID. So we know that identifiables have a var on them called id to make them identifiable. So what if I just say backslash item dot id and then view for item? This work could just do this? Oh, not quite. It says your key path value item dot id cannot be converted to a contextual type id. In other words, our id don't care is not necessarily the same type as this identifiables dot id, which is it don't care for the identifiable. But we can actually force that too by saying ID its type equals the items ID. This ID right here is the don't care for identifiable, and this ID is our don't care. So by forcing these to be the same, we make it so that we can call this init. This is the kind of thing you can do with constraints and gains. A little bit advanced topic here but it makes it so the old grid initializer here will work and the new grid will initialize will work. All right, enough of a time out there. Should make it so that our grid right here will work and let's see what happens when we do this. All right, ready, click. Oh, it 
well, it's not vertical anymore, it's horizontal. And this is actually the grid doing what it was asked. It took this little space that it was offered, this line, which is what forms offer their things there, took this little space and it made all the emoji fit in there. And this is the best way you could make them fit. What we really want to do is to offer this thing more space. We want this to be taller. We want this little white rectangle to be taller. I'm going to do that with frame as well. I'm going to give this thing a height. And I'm going to have its height. I'm going to give more height when there's more emoji. The more emoji you have, the more height I'm going to give you. And that should make them be spaced out about the same, no matter how many emoji you have. If you have a thousand, I'm going to give you a lot of height. If you have just three or four, I'm just going to give you this tiny little height. So how the heck do we do that? Very simple. This grid, I'm going to give it a fixed height. I'm going to just have a bar for that. Bar height. So do you float? I'm going to calculate it. I played around with this and I come up with something like this. Float chosen palette dot count minus one divided by six times 70 plus 70. That seemed to be the kind of best fit for making these things spread themselves out. And you can go play with that math yourself later. Let's see. Yeah, it's pretty good. And I just would like these emojis to be a little bigger, though, since I've given them a nice little amount of space. We'll do that by setting this font size right here. Font.system size. Let's go ahead and have a self.font size as well. These things down here are essentially drawing constants, height, and also let our font size be, let's say, around 40. Seems like a good size for those things. There we go. And it's still work here. This is still a grid. It knows how to show things. So let's get rid of the football, tennis ball. This is not an activity. There we go. So this looks great. This is a nice, compact little UI. Makes it really easy for people to go through, change the emoji that they want inside each of their palettes right here. I'm going to show you some other ways to present this, though. This is a popover. Makes perfect sense on the iPad here. There's another way to present it on iPad, which instead of using a popover right here, we use something called a sheet. So a sheet looks like this. It's larger, it's good for UIs that take up a lot of space, obviously. Probably for our purposes, the popover is better. This is, really doesn't need to be this large. You're never gonna have really long names of palettes. You're never, probably not gonna be adding 100 emoji at once. And this doesn't need to be so spaced out as this. And these things can be dismissed, not by clicking away though. See, I'm clicking, touching outside. You swipe them down to make them go away. Now, I find that this swiping down, eh, it's a little bit of a hidden UI to be swiping down to make this go away. So if I were doing this in a sheet, I would probably put a little done button, or like a close button or something up here. Done is usually a good word for it. It means that you're done with this thing. So how would we put a button in this UI that when we clicked it, caused it to dismiss itself? That's a really good thing to know how to do. Let's put that done button in there first. I'm gonna do that. Here's here's the title bar, that palette editor title bar. Let's go ahead and make a Z stack that has that title and then also has an H stack, which has a spacer to move the button all the way over to the right and then has a button. And the button, we'll talk about the action in a second here. The label will have it be text of the word done. And we'll put some padding on this one as well. Just to make sure it's got the room it needs. Let's take a look and see what that looks like. So I've got a Z stack, so I'm laying this on top of this thing where the button is spaced out to the right. Oh yeah, looking good, that's done. So. Clicking done, nothing is happening because we didn't put anything in our action. So what are we going to do when we touch this done button to make this whoop go away? Very 
straightforward to do here in button, we are going to have to have some indication here, set some bool that says whether this is currently showing. I'm gonna call that is showing equals false. And this is showing is gonna be similar, in fact, very similar to this show palette ever over here that determines whether this is showing. In fact, it is exactly this Boolean. This Boolean is what makes this sheet appear in the first place. So if somehow this is showing could set this, then it would make this go away. And we know how to make this be hooked up to this. That's what bindings are for. So let's make another binding here is showing, which is going to be a bool. And we wanna bind this is showing up to this one up here. So just like we bound the chosen palette using this binding right here, we're gonna bind is showing using this show palette editor here. This is how we make these things come and go. We share a bool. It might be an identifiable in some cases, to some Swift UI, but it's often just a bool that says whether this thing is showing. Let's see if this works. Here we go at this and bloop, gone. And bloop, it's back. And all we're doing when I click this, when I click this, is setting this show palette editor state. Here's the setting it to true, and here, is setting it to false inside this other view through a binding. Now we've been doing a lot of work with this on the iPad. This is all iPad work here. What about iPhone? Is this all gonna work on the iPhone? Let's take a look. Let's see if this works on an iPhone. Woohoo! Look at that, it works unchanged. Here's that sheet. Done, nice. We can even swipe down to get rid of this one as well. And we've got this, we can edit it. Let's go change this to be activity stuff. Activity stuff, very good. We can add emojis. Let's go add an emoji here. Now, when I click on this to edit it, it wants me to use the hardware keyboard and type. So one thing you have to be careful about when you're working on your app in a simulator is whether you have the hardware keyboard on. And you control that in the simulator with this IO menu. You see it says keyboard right here. And right now I have hardware keyboard connected. If I disconnect the hardware keyboard, then I'll get the keyboard that your actual users are gonna have to make, which I really recommend you use this because you're putting yourself in the shoes of your users when you use this versus typing on your keyboard. They don't some of them might have a hardware keyboard connected with Bluetooth or something, but 99% of them are gonna to have to type in here as well. So it helps you make sure that your UI is actually usable and not relying on typing too much. So let's add soccer and what is it? Cricket right there. Well, I'm double clicking unnecessarily there. We're gonna see that works fine. So uh, if you put two of them in there, it only puts one in. That's my little add emoji that's doing that. So it added the emojis there, and I could remove the bicyclist or whatever. I'm editing this. And when I hit done, yeah, we got, oh, there's no bicyclist in there anymore. Got our new ones in there. So this is working great for iPhone right here. Unfortunately, there's no way to add a background image. So that's a problem we're gonna have to fix on iPhone. And also it's just about getting to be time here to be able to have multiple documents. Right now we always just have this one untitled document that we're editing, and that's true on iPad as well. So our next step is going to be able to, to add some UI here to have a list of documents, different emoji art documents that we can click on and it'll show us each of the documents. And this is gonna allow us to learn something more in uh, Swift UI, which is how to have multiple view models in your app. Because right now we have a view model that represents an emoji art document, that's great. We're gonna need a new view model, which represents a bunch of emoji art documents in storage somewhere. So let's dive into this by creating our view model for a store of emoji art documents, stored emoji art documents. Now, I we've already seen how to create view models 
it would be a little bit repetitive to go do that. So I actually created my emoji art document store here. We're going to drag it in and take a look at it, copy it in. It's kind of the world's simplest little storage thing here. But notice that it is a view model class and observable object. And this view model has a name. So this is like the name of the store. We'll probably call it our emoji art store or something like that. This is where the things are stored. But then it also has the name for all the documents in the store. You can get the name of a document. See, this is just an emoji art document. This is our other view model. So in a way, this is a view model that has other view models as it's part of its content here. But you can set a name for a document right down here. You can get all the documents that we have names for, which is nice. You can add documents, the title or not. It'll use untitled if you don't specify a name. And you can remove documents down here. And believe it or not, this whole store, this whole thing, only has one var that's actually doing any storage. It's a published var, of course, because when it changes, we are an observable object. We're a view model. We want our views to find out. And this store is just a dictionary with emoji art documents as the keys and their names of the documents as a string. That's it. That is the entirety of the storage in this view model. And that's really all we need. We just need the document names. That's and uh, we can access them out of our store. By the way, it's very common to have view models that are essentially stores, storage places for things. Our view model that we've had for memorize and that you had for set are really more logic oriented. This is really not a lot of logic here. I guess naming these things is kind of logic, but mostly it's just storing things. So you'll see a lot of view models that have the word store in their name. Now, I've done a couple of things here is I've used the publisher stuff that we know about to have it auto save into user defaults. Again, user defaults are the only storage mechanism we know so far, so I'm having to use user defaults. I wouldn't store these documents in user defaults in the real world, but it's simple to do. One thing about storing thing in user default is we know that user defaults only stores property lists. And this is most certainly not a property list because this is not one of the prescribed types, string, int, date, data. It's none of those things. It's its own custom class. So I had to write a little bit of code down here. I put it as an extension to dictionary that converts this dictionary to a property list and back. So this gets it as a property list and this creates from a property list. That way I could have user default set object for key and set uh, and get the object get the object for key and set the object for key as a property list. Now, and you can look at that later how how I did that. It's kind of kind of cool. Uh, but not super important because again, we're talking about interfacing with an old API here in user default, so it's not super important to understand what's going on in here, but I'm using this as thing that I talked about and we're using any, so this is really kind of old stuff. Anyway, you can see I have a lot of red here, a lot of error, and it's mostly this error that's causing the problem right here. Generic struct dictionary requires that emoji art documents conform to hashable. Anytime you want to be the key of a dictionary, you have to be hashable. Now, we've seen this hashable protocol before. We didn't see how to implement it, but we saw that it exists. It was over here in our grid, okay, for each is essentially creating up a little dictionary with these items and all these views as the values. And so that's why we had to say that that ID into this thing, it's gotta be a hashable thing so that for each can put them in a dictionary or whatever it's doing inside there. So we have seen hashable before, but now we're gonna have to actually implement hashable in emoji art document because we want emoji art document itself to be hashable. So here's emoji art document. It's a view model, it's a class and our requirement is that it be hashable. Now, what is in this hashable protocol? It only has one function in it. This function is called hash, as you might have guessed, and you can see it's right there, into hasher. So this hasher is just an object that's given to you when you're being asked to hash, and it only really has one function in it. This hasher has combine, and you give it something here that is itself hashable and it combines possibly multiple things inside your object to make it hashable. So we're combining hashable things to make something hashable. 
Now, what could we combine here? What makes us unique enough to be hashed, right? To be put into a hash table. Uh, well, of course, our emoji, our document itself is quite unique. It's got emojis and the background in there. So we could make this hashable and then combine here, have emoji art, but it's a little bit overkill to do that. And it actually might not be that good in that every time we change our document, our hash is gonna change. It'd be a lot better if we had some unique identifier that we could hash in here. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna create a little unique identifier here. I'm gonna call it ID and I'm gonna make it be a UUID. Now I mentioned UUID before. This is a little struct that generates a unique thing. That's really all it's for is to create a unique thing. Now, the reason I called my little unique identifier ID is because now I can also say that I'm identifiable, which might be nice someday. Why, why call this something else when it is a unique identifiable thing? Might as well get identifiable for free here. So I'm just going to combine that and hash that. So my hashing is basically going to be the hashing of this. Luckily, UUID is a hashable thing itself. That seems like that should be enough, but we got more complaints up here. Emoji art document does not conform to equatable. So to be hashable, you also have to implement equatable. In other words, there's an inheritance relationship between hashable and equatable, those two protocols. So what is in the equatable protocol? I'm actually gonna use fix right here to give us protocol stubs, basically show us what's in there. Boop. And it's just this one function. It totally makes sense when you think about it. It's a static function on the type called equals equals. Remember that Swift can use any, we could use emoji as the name of a function. So equals equals is just a perfectly reasonable uh, name of a function. That's all this is, the name of this function. It takes two arguments, a left-hand side and a right-hand side, both of which of course are emoji art documents. And it's returning a bool whether these two things are equal. So for us, that's really easy. Left-hand side dot ID equals right-hand side dot ID. If those IDs are the same, this unique ID, then this must be the same document. But a word of warning here, this strategy is really only gonna work for a reference type or a class because we're all seeing the same version of it in the heap. For a struct, it's a value type. We're copying it around all the time we actually need to be able to see is this copy equals equals to this other copy. And we wouldn't want to do that just by the ID. That's what identifiable is for. We actually need to check and see if all the vars are equal to each other. And same thing for hashing. We want to hash all the vars in there. And in fact, that's the default implementation of hashable in Swift is for structs to check all the vars. And we do this in our emoji art model. We have a little substruct there, the emoji, and we marked it hashable, and hashable includes equatable. And yet we didn't have to do equals equals or hash. We just used the default version that we got from Swift, which checks all the variables. But for a class, this is a nice, really very, very simple way to get equality and hashability and identity all in very simple code. And we can use this little bit of code for one more thing, which is that right now we store our emoji art documents in user default, but we store them as this untitled. So they're not each separately being stored as something else. But now that we have a unique ID, we can still store them in default, but instead of under untitled with that unique ID. So to do that, I'm going to have my init take the ID, the UID, for that particular uh, emoji art document, because if you give me the ID, I'll go look it up in user default and get it for you. And I could have it default to creating a random UUID, then I wouldn't even need to do this initialization here. I could just have this be let ID UD ID and then say self.id equals this ID. This defaulting, we haven't done it much in our demos, but hopefully you know about that, that you can have a something default, and then someone could call my init with no arguments, and it would get some new identifier, which makes sense. If I create an emoji art, with, or emoji art document with no arguments, I wanted to get its own unique ID. I'm gonna show you another way that you'll often see this defaulting done, which is instead of setting equal something, it'll make it an optional, 
and set it equal to nil, and then do this defaulting right here. Now, why would we do it this way? Why would we make this an optional? Because now we can call this init with no arguments, or we can call it with a UUID, or we can call it with nil. So that adds a little more flexibility in how we create this emoji art document. It's totally flexibility. It's really no other difference otherwise. But you're, I mentioned this because you're going to see this in Swift, where there are functions that seem to take an argument that is an optional that defaults to nil. And you're like, why does it do that? Well, this is all it's doing. It wants to keep whatever it defaults it to internal. It doesn't want it to be made explicit and so that people can see what the default is. They, for some reason, don't want that to be public information. So perfectly fine. So now, instead of storing this as untitled, right, this untitled, let's get rid of that. Instead, I'm just going to have a little let here, defaults key, and we're going to have this be emoji art document dot, and I'm going to use this little embedding of strings here to put my ID in there as a string. And it has a nice function here, UUID string, that will give it to you that way. So this is the default key I'm going to use instead of this untitled in both when I'm getting it there and when I am saving it. So now I've made my documents persist always in user defaults. So that's it for our store. And we're going to use this store right now as the view model of a new view that we're going to build that lets us choose documents. So it's a document chooser. Let's go ahead in here and Create a new Swift UI view. It is a Swift UI view, this chooser. It's a, it's a list of documents, but it is a view. I'm going to call it my emoji art document chooser. I might be starting to regret putting emoji art document in front of everything here, but not really. It's nice to have good, clear names of things. So here is my chooser. And this chooser is essentially going to have a store. And I'm going to make the store be an environment object as well. I could make this observed object, but I'm just trying to mix it up here. I'm not really putting this in a popover or sheet that would require me to do environment object. But it, this is pretty common to use environment object, especially for a top level view like this that's going to be choosing other views, etc. So how do we take get our list of objects in our store here and display them in our body? We know exactly how to take a list of something and show it. We do a for each, and we're going to do the store.documents. And now I'm awfully glad that I made emoji heart document identifiable because store.documents over here is an array of emoji art document. Woo, this has to be identifiable for for each to work. And woo, we got it to be identifiable by making this be called ID. And of course, I knew I was going to do that, but you can see the benefit there of having done that. All right, so we've got our documents. And for each document, I just want to create a view that kind of shows that document in the list. So we'll do that by just doing a text, let's say, of the store's name for that document. So it's just going to be a list of the names of the documents. Now, of course, we know for each doesn't do layout. So we have to put this in an H stack or a V stack or a grid or some kind of layout thing. And we're going to learn a new one today. This one is called a list. So list, kind of like a V stack, feels a little bit like a V stack, but it's much more powerful that it creates a big scrollable list with separators and all that stuff. And it looks just like in what you've seen in other apps, what in the old UI kit we called a table view. Now we have to pass, our, and we'll see this in just a second. We have to pass our store in here. And also, I want this document chooser, when I run my app right now, it's showing me an emoji art document. But I want it to show this chooser instead. So I'm going to have to go back to my scene delegate here and not do this emoji art document view and instead do an emoji art document chooser. And this takes no arguments, okay? but it does want you to provide this environment object, which has to be the store. So we're going to have to create that store. I'm going to say let store equal our emoji and emoji art 
document store. And this happens to take a name. So I'm going to call mine emoji art. That's going to be the name of this document store. And let's even put a couple of documents in there. So store.add document, maybe store.add document named hello world. So all this stuff I'm doing here, add document and creating the store, that's all the stuff that's in store here, right? Here's add document, creates that. Here's document, uh, creating the document. Uh, initializer is right here, right? And it named, I'm just creating this. I'm not doing anything special here. I'm just creating the store. And then I'm setting the store as the environment for my chooser so that my chooser has this store and it can go through all the store's documents and show the names. It's going to do it in this list UI. So let's see what this list looks like. Woohoo! There we go. We've got our two documents. Now, this is a scrollable list. So we can scroll it up and down. So this store itself is persistent. So if we go back to our scene delegate over here and delete these add documents and rerun, they'll stay in the list right there. Now this is great, but when we tap on these, it does not show us these documents. Hello world and untitled, it's not showing them to us. To make it so that clicking on things navigates to a different view to show us those documents, we have to embed our list right here in another view called a navigation view. So navigation view, which very often, almost always, we're putting a list inside a navigation. It's not absolutely required. Sometimes we might put a form in here, possibly. So our navigation view has only changed our view a little bit here, but it's still not making it so if we tap on these, I'm tapping on these, it's not making any difference. That's because these are just texts right here. Text, when you tap on them, they don't know how to navigate. So we're going to wrap these also in a view called a navigation link. Now, navigation link has quite a few ways to create it, but in all of them, there's a very important argument you can see right here called destination. This destination is where this link is gonna go when you tap on it. In other words, give me a view to navigate to when I click on this. So in our case, the destination we want is we want an emoji art document view that shows this document that you just clicked on, right? We're in a for each, got these documents. We want to go to a document view that shows this document. And now we put this text inside the content of this navigation link view. So this is how we make it so that things that are in our list are navigatable. Let's see that in action. All right, now notice something has changed. Now there's a little greater than sign here. That's letting the user know if you tap on this, it's gonna go somewhere. And let's try. Whoop, there it is. Look at that. All right, we have different documents here. Now, this is all a little kind of blank and it's hard to tell what's going on. But the navigation view provides a lot of mechanism to make this all more understandable to the user. For example, titles. We can put a title, that's what this kind of blank space at the top here is. And we can put a title in front of, on top of this list, and we can also put a different title if we want on top of this view right here. So when you're in a navigation view and you're navigating around, you can put titles on each one. You set this title on each view that can appear here. So we're gonna set a title on this list, then we're gonna set a title on this emoji art document view do that. So here's the list. Let's set its title. So when the list is showing, the navigation bar title is going to be, how about the store's name, the name of our store, because that's what this list is showing. It's showing all the documents in this store. Let's do the store's name. Store name is just a bar here in the store. Keeps track of its name, nothing more than that. And then here's our emoji art document view right here. Let's put a name on it as well, navigation bar title. This is the store's name for this document. Now, notice that I am putting 
this bar title onto this view. This is the emoji doc, our document view that I show when I navigate here, the destination. So when this view is showing, this is the title it will use. Navigation bar title, you put it on the view that will be showing. And this is what you get. Emoji art, that's the name of our store. When we click, hello world, that's the name of this document, right? This is the hello world document. This is the untitled document. Now there's other things that we can put here besides a title. We can actually put some buttons. Like it would be nice to have a little buttons at the top here. Maybe a button that adds another emoji art, create a new untitled document. So I'm going to put a little plus button right here that does exactly that. Right down here. This is on the this is this button's only going to be available when this list is showing, not over here when the emoji art document view is showing, only when the list is showing. Navigation bar items, this is called. And you can have leading and trailing. I'll put this on the leading side. And it's just a button. We know how to do buttons, so this is, we'll do that in a second. And the label for this button is going to be an image. I'll use the system name here. I'm going to do plus. Again, I got that by going over here to SF symbols and searching around for what made sense for plus. We'll also do a large scale here. This button big. And what we're going to do when this plus button is click? No problem. Store, add document. Just add a document to our store. So we're adding this button to the bar items on the leading edge of this navigation view. There it is right there. Notice that, that plus button is not there here. Instead, we have this going back button right there. It's because when we're over here, this navigation bar items was not added up here to the emoji art document view. And we're showing this emoji art document view over here when we click on it. And so it doesn't get that plus button. Now let's try plus. We got another untitled document right here. Nice. Now we could also add some bar items over here in our emoji art document view. For example, maybe it's time to make it so that this app is actually usable on an iPhone to so we can set a background image. There's no back drag and drop in iPhone. So to set a background image, we're gonna have to do it a different way. And just to be simple, how about copy and paste? You go find the image you want, you copy it. You come back here and hit paste. And I'm going to have the paste here be a little button in the upper right. Now, since I only want this paste button to appear when I'm showing a document, I'm going to put the code for this button in emoji art document view, because that's what's showing here. So that's what's going to control this button. So I'm going to go to emoji art document view and let's go down you know, maybe right here after on drop and add navigation bar items here. This time I want it to be on the trailing side of it. And let's just make another button. And this button, put the action in a second. And the label, let's have the label be an image system name. And I searched around in SF symbols. I found one kind of cool doc on clipboard. <laughs> so this is an icon that shows when there's a dock on the clipboard. Let's go image scale large again. And so that's really cool, perfect image for doing that. And what are we going to do when they try to paste from the pasteboard? Well, we're going to paste from the pasteboard, which turns out to be really easy to do in iOS. I'm going to say if let URL equal my general pasteboard URL bar, if that's not nil, then I'm going to set my documents background URL equal to that URL. So let's understand the pasteboard a little bit here. Pasteboard.general is a shared pasteboard that represents the pasteboard in this device. It has a lot of different vars like string, URL, other kinds of types where if the thing on the pasteboard can be represented as that, it returns non-nil here. So if there's a URL in the pasteboard, we're going to try and set it as our background right here. Let's see if that works. So I have a little world here. Oh, there it is. Click. That's eh, not doing anything. Let's go see if we can put something in the pasteboard. Eh, let's go get my favorite image over there, which is not this one. I like this one right here. There it is. I'm just going to press and hold and say copy. Let's say copy an image. 
iOS, go back here and paste. Woo! It worked. I can zoom in. Nice. Can I? I can even play a little soccer in the front yard right here. Okay, excellent. So this is fantastic. Fortunately, when I did this one, I found another little bug in our emoji art. Watch this. I can go back out and let's go back. Oh no, there's my emoji, but I lost my background image. And that turns out in our emoji art background view, we did a pretty good job when we zoomed to fit of protecting against the image being zero size, but we forgot to protect against the view being zero size. Because when that view is coming on screen, it seems to be momentarily have zero height. I'm not sure exactly what process that's happening, but we zoom to fit it to zero at that point. So I'm also going to check here and zoom to fit that my size dot height is greater than zero and my size dot width is greater than zero. I'm just being more protective in zoom to fit so that it doesn't set the zoom scale here to zero. I never want my zoom scale to be zero because then I can't see my doc document. Uh, if I go back here to my simulator, I can actually double tap and it will zoom it up from zero, which is good, but I don't ever want it to put it in that zero stage. So let's do it with this fix right here. So hello world, here's our document right here. Maybe we'll zoom it way out and we'll go out and then back in. Okay, well now interesting. So it did not zoom to zero, but it zoomed it back up to its full size. Even though I had zoomed it down, when I went out and back, it lost that zooming. And this is something to consider when you have these views coming and going because of navigation. So I'm navigating out and back in. When you're doing this, these views are being reconstructed and their at sign state is mostly preserved, but some kind of state may not be preserved. And for example, our scaling state is not preserved across doing this. Now, if you want state to be preserved though, there's a great place to do it, your view model. Okay, no matter how, what is happening on the view side, if your view model is holding on to it, it's going to be preserved. Now, that's not the same as putting it in the model. I don't want the scaling to be part of the model. The model is the house and whatever emojis there are, but it doesn't include how scaled it is. But putting it in my view model, if my view model doesn't turn around and put it in the model, it's perfectly fine to do. And it provides sharing across multiple views that might be looking at this same document view model. So let's go do that. How would we do that? We're just gonna make it here so that our steady state, let's search, where's our steady state pan offset? Here it is. So here's steady state pan offset, and here's our steady state zoom offset up here. We're gonna have these, instead of being at sign state in our view, we're gonna put them into our view model. So let's do that. Let's cut these out of here and put them in our view model, which is right here. And we'll put it right down here, I think. And of course, they're not state in the view model. Instead, they'd be published. And I'm not going to make them private because I'm going to allow my view to set them and get them. And then my view over here, I'm just going to replace everywhere I have steady state with document dot steady state instead. So let's to do that everywhere. So we go back to our hand offset. There we go. Now let's try that. All right, hello world. Here it is. Now let's zoom out. This zooming is being kept in our view model. So now if we go back and come back in, it's still there in our view model, even though this view has gotten rebuilt. Now there's a little more that we could do here to be nicer to our user. One thing is this little button. A lot of times you click it and nothing happens. Okay, so over here and we click it, nothing's happening. Okay, that thing is no longer in the pasteboard. I copied and pasted this steady state thing, so it's gone. So I'm not giving my user much feedback about what this button does. It's not clear. I guess it looks like something copied on the pasteboard, I guess, but it's like, what are we going to do to make this give some feedback? So, how about if they click on this and it's not going to do something there, we put up a little alert that explains what this is. So that gives us an opportunity to learn how to put alerts up. And putting alerts up, quite easy. We're gonna go over here and put it 
on this image, if you click on this image, we want to put an alert up. Now, alerts are interesting little view modifiers here. They start out looking a lot like a popover. You can see that they've got the identifiable binding version if you want to put different things up in your alert, depending on what's going on. But it also has this nice is presented, which is the one we're going to use. And we're going to need to have some sort of Boolean bar that says whether this alert should be up. And I'm going to call it explain background paste. This is going to be my state private var explain background paste. I'm going to start out as false. I don't want that alert showing when we first come up. And I just need to set this to make this alert be presented. And where am I going to set that? I'm going to set it here. I'm going to set it anytime that I'm not updating the background here. So I'm going to say else if I'm not updating the background, if it would just be clicking the button and doing nothing. And I'm going to say self.explain background paste equals true. And that's going to cause this alert to show up. People will also do this if the URL is not equal to our existing background URL. So if you've already pasted it and then you try and paste again, then we won't paste. Instead, we'll explain this background paste to you and how it works. Now, alert doesn't have you present with a view builder here. You can see that its return value of this little closure that you're giving an alert is not a view builder or a view, it's an alert. So we're actually going to be returning an alert here, return alert. So alert can provide messages and then you can either have a single dismiss button, like OK button, that's what we want, or it can actually have two buttons, like an OK button and a cancel button. So let's go ahead and use this one that just has a single to make it clearer here, I will separate these arguments out so you can see them better. All right, here's our alert. And the title and the message are both text. So the title, I'm going to have it be paste background because that's what the user tried to do. And then the message, let's say this is where we're going to explain ourselves. We'll say uh, copy the URL of an image to the clipboard and touch this button, the one you just clicked on, to make it the background of your document. And this is the kind of thing that, first of all, needs to be internationalizable to other languages. And also, we're going to focus test, and we're going to have maybe documentation. People can help us pick good wording so that people won't be confused by what's going on, et cetera, here. And then finally, we have the dismiss button, which is of type alert.button. Now, alert.button is a class that has a lot of static funks on it, and some of them are default buttons. That's just a normal button. There's also destructive buttons, and there are cancel buttons. So in this case, we just want the default button, and the label for it is just going to be a text that says OK. And this also takes a closure that will be executed when this button is pressed. Now, in our case, we don't need to do anything when this OK is pressed. We just want it to dismiss. And this default button, this dismiss button, will set this back to false for us. This dollar, by the way, always goes here. So we don't have to go in here and set this back to false to cause our alert to go away. It'll do that for us. See how this shows up in the UI here. Go back to Hello World. Here's our document. Click here, it says, oh, paste back, copy this, explain to me, oh, what you, what are you going to do? Oh, okay, so I'll do that. I'll go over here. This time, maybe I'll go and get the image I don't like quite as much, this guy. Right here, to copy this. Go back here. Now hit paste. Oh, it pasted it. But actually, this is a little scary that it pasted. This is kind of a low-res version of our horses here. Because uh, it's like, oh, ooh, I didn't know it was going to do that. Why? Wow, what the heck? So maybe we need even a little bit more alerting going on here, where if you click this and it's going to do this background, then it's going to ask you first if that's really what you want. So how do we put up an alert that asks us yes or no, do we want to do something? Well, same exact way where we're going to have to have some state. So I'm going to call this state instead of calling it explain background paste i'm going to call it confirm background 
paste and then I'll just set this confirm background paste right here to true. Confirm background paste equals true. And now I need another alert right here, another alert that is going to respect, react to this being set to true. Now, something very important to understand about alerts. You cannot put two alerts with is presented on the same view. So I cannot put another alert on image right here. It has to be on some other view, or I have to use the other alert, which takes an identifiable. And that identifiable, usually an enum, is going to pick which alert to show, this one or this one. And I might well decide that instead of having this be a bool, I want this to be an enum that has explain or confirm. And then I will do my alert with the binding, being a binding to a state with that enum. That, that probably will be a better way to do it than these two bools. Uh, but for demo purposes, we'll keep going here. So where am I going to put this alert? Since I can't put it on image, well, I can put it almost anywhere. This is our geometry reader. This is our top level V stack. We'll go ahead and put it on our top level V stack, but it really doesn't matter as long as it's a view that's on screen at the time this happens. And I'm going to type this in really fast. There we go. And this one, similar, right? Alert is presented. It's using this confirm as the decision maker. Same title. Here it's saying, replace your background with, and now it's showing you the URL it's going to use. That's kind of cool. It's in the pasteboard. And now I have a primary button, which is again, a default text okay, but now I am providing a closure. So now when this okay button is pressed, I am going to set my background URL to general URL. That's the code that used to be up here. Now I'm putting it down here. It only happens if I click okay in this alert, right? And now I have a second button, which is a, dot cancel button. Remember, these are all alert dot button dot cancel. And Swift is just inferring that because it knows this argument takes an alert dot button. Let's see this one in action. Go to the hello world document right here and click. Oh, it's telling you copy the URL. Okay, I'm going to go do that. I'll go back here. Let's go back, go back to our favorite one. Copy it over here. And now when I hit this, it should ask me to confirm. Oh, replace your background with this URL. And I can either say cancel, no, don't do it. Or I can go over here and say, yeah, do it. So that's alert. So we've learned alerts. We've learned cheats. We've learned popovers. We've learned navigation views. There's a lot of different ways to decide how to build your UI here to get the information in front of the user as best you can. Now, one last thing I want to do is to have this view right here be a little more changeable. For example, I'd like to be able to delete items that I want, like, to, like swiping to delete or somehow clicking to delete. And I want to be able to rename my documents. Okay, there's no way to these untitles, I can't give them names. So how am I going to rename these documents? So let's do that. Turns out to be really easy to make delete work. All you have to do to make delete work, it's a function in for each. So if you in your for each say on delete, it will give you what's called an index set. So an index set is kind of like an array of indices and it's telling you the things that were deleted. Now in, in iOS, you're doing swipe to delete. This is always going to be an array with one thing in it, and, but we're still going to try and write our code in general terms so that we can go through all of these things in there and delete them all. I'm going to write the code that does the delete of this store in a little bit of what you might call advanced Swift, but I'm just using the primitives in Swift, specifically in index set and in array to write this code a little more succinctly. So watch me do this. I'm going to take the index set and I'm going to map it to getting from my store the documents at those indices. So now I have an array of documents at those indexes. And I'm going to ask that array for each of them, each of the documents that is, just ask the store to remove that document. This is a succinct way of basically saying, for all the things in the index set, just remove that document. I'm doing it by having a little map in between that maps the indexes to the documents. 
So this kind of coding right here, you, eventually you'll get used to doing this. Real Swift programmers are doing stuff like this. This is actually just as easy, if not easier to read than having two, four loops here that are going through the index set and then going through the documents. That's like six or seven lines of code, a lot to read and parse, whereas this is much more straightforward to read. So let's see this in action. Anytime you have a delete there and you're in a list, I can swipe to delete. You see that I just swiped left. Now, if I don't want to delete, I can push it back to the right. If I swipe to delete all the way and it goes away, or I can swipe to delete partially and confirm by pressing that button. So that's how the delete works. Now, still add documents back here. That's one way to do delete, and it's a nice way to do it. There's another way, which is there's a special button in iOS that you can put called the edit button. And I'm going to put it up here in the trailing situation in this view. And this will put you in an edit mode where there are little delete buttons on each line. So how do we do that? Here's the leading button for my bar items. I'm going to add the trailing button. And this is just going to be the edit button. OK, so edit button is a Swift UI struct. And when you put the edit button in here and you click edit, if you have a list here and there's a on delete on your for each, it will put you in this mode where you can delete by clicking these instead of doing swipe to delete. That's pretty cool, right? A little delete edit mode right there. Now, the last thing I want to do is be able to edit my document names, but I, I really want to be able to edit them just by clicking on them to edit them. But I don't really want to click on them to edit them when it's like this because I want to show my document. But how about when it's in edit mode. See, when it's in edit mode and I click, it, it doesn't navigate anyway because I'm editing it. So this would be a great time if I clicked on these to have them edit in place. Just turn these texts into text fields. Well, we need to find out when this done button is clicked, right? And this done button clicking actually affects something in your at sign environment. Remember those at sign environments like color scheme? Well, there's another one there called edit mode, and it's a kind of a special one. So we're going to go take a look at that one in the documentation. Here's environment values right here. And environment values is the thing that's listing all this stuff like color scheme and all the things that can be in your environment. And one of them is at edit mode right here. You see this edit mode? But look at the type of edit mode. Let's click on it. It is a binding to an edit mode and an Edit mode is just an enum that has active, inactive, or transient. It has a nice bar whether we're editing or not. So this makes sense. I've got this edit mode whether I'm editing or not. But why is it a binding? And not only a binding, an optional binding. Notice also that this is get set. So this environment value we can actually set. So if you want to know whether that done button is has been activated or not, you're going to set this environment variable to be a binding to some edit mode state in your view. That's how you get this. Now, why do they do this in direction to the binding and all that? Well, because whenever that done button is clicked, you want to find out. And bindings, remember, when they change, when the value they point to changes, they cause your view to redraw, which is exactly what you want. So this is how we're going to find out the edit mode. It's not a lot of the environmental values are like this whether you have bindings and all this, but for edit mode, it makes perfect sense. So we're going to have to set this environment. Now, we didn't learn in the slides how to set the environment. We know how to get the environment, right? We do something like at sign environment, backslash dot edit mode, and you can get the edit mode that way, but it's not. we don't want to get it here. We want to set it. So the way we set environment is we use dot environment. Dot environment takes the path, edit mode, and then it takes what you want to set it to. And remember, this is a binding, so I'm going to have to set a binding to some edit mode. And so this is going to have to be some state in our view. So at sign state private bar edit mode, which is a type edit mode. And this is a binding. And a couple of things here. Notice this is a var, it needs an initial value. And start with, it's either going to be 
dot inactive or dot active or dot transient. Those are the three ones. And obviously when we first start up our view, it's inactive. So we'll set that to inactive. The other thing that's super important to understand is that dot environment sets that var in environment values only for the view you call it on. Okay, this is setting the environment for whatever view you call it on. This is the view I am calling environment on. So it is setting the environment for this view. Now, this view in here somewhere has to have the edit button. Okay, if the view you set the environment on does not have the edit button, then when the edit button clicks, it's not going to be setting this binding because this binding won't have been set into environment. So that means we can't put the environment up here, for example. You might think, oh, let's put the environment up here. Well, this won't work because this only sets the environment for this view and the edit button isn't in this view. So the edit button would never see this environment. So we need this environment down here, including it, whatever you send it to has to include the edit button. In this case, this bar items. So make sense there? A little subtlety some people miss, but when you set the environment an environment variable that's settable, it only sets it in the views that you set it on. Let's see this in action just to make sure it doesn't broken here. All right, so hit edit, all works good. All right, done. So now when we're in edit mode, we know we're in edit mode because this edit mode is going to be set. So we want to change this from being a text to being a text field, essentially. So right here is where we have our text. I actually created a nice little struct called editable text. So let's grab that. It's right here. Drag this in. Copy it in. We're not going to look at editable text very much, but at its heart, it's a text field. It's doing some other kind of tricky things to be to nicely switch out when it's editable or not editable and it takes an additional argument which is is editing and this is editing just is whether or not this editable text is currently editing and for us that's is our self dot edit mode dot is editing i think that's this edit mode if this is editing this is just a var that looks at this inactive state or active state and tells you where whether it's editing and it also takes a nice little closure at the end. Anytime this editable text changes, so the user changed it, then it calls this closure for you with the text. And in our case, this is the name. So I'm calling this argument name. Could be called text or whatever you want. And when that happens, of course, I want to set the name in our store for that document. So I'm just replacing this with this little editable text. So let's see if this works. All right, here we go. We're gonna edit and click. Woo, look at that. Hello, how about hello there? Oops. And now we're done. And this is hello there is the name of that. We change this entitled right here, edit, call this maybe our barn notice it's automatically keeping it in alphabetical order because that's the store does that so this is a barn so maybe we'll put our barn over here it's telling us what to do that's good over here back to the barn here's the barn low res barn here copy back and paste and yes we do want to paste it there it is so that's our barn. Here's our hello there. Here's an untitled document. Woo! So we built a pretty functional little app here. It's pretty easy to use, direct manipulation. And a lot of this we've done by presenting views in different ways, whether it's sheets or popovers. By the way, let's go take, right here we are in iPhone. Let's go back and make sure we haven't broken anything on our iPad over here. We did an awful lot of work over there on the iPhone. So I sure hope this still looks good on iPad. Whoa. So actually this is interesting. This looks quite a bit different here. You can see that our chooser is on screen with this space, which is actually our documents. 
So we could see both at the same time on the iPad. And as we've seen, SwiftUI will adapt whatever user interface we've declared to the device that it's on. So it's not necessarily a perfect UI here for iPad. I'm not sure I need to be able to see my document chooser on screen at all times. Might want to put that document chooser in a popover even on iPad, but we can certainly see that it did something quite sensible as a default here. Now you can see that I've already loaded up a couple of documents here, barn and house to make this go a little bit quicker. So let's take a look and make sure that we haven't done anything to break our palette editor here. Hmm, it uh, appears to be working here, but I think this looked better as a popover. So let's jump back over to our palette chooser and change this sheet back to being a popover. Get our house document up here. Let's zoom in a little bit. And let's click, huh, I'm tapping here on this keyboard. It's not working, I'm clicking on this. Why is this not working to click on this? Well, the problem is that we're zoomed way out. And even though we click to draw in this space, our view is still large. And when we're tapping here, trying to tap on this keyboard, our view happens to be in front. And so it's intercepting, even though it's not drawing up here, it's still intercepting the taps. So how do we fix that? How do we make it so that this doesn't get in front? You can control which views are in front using something called the Z index modifier. So let's go back to our document view over here. And we're gonna make it so that our whole geometry reader here is kept in the back by setting it to Z index to minus one. The default Z index is zero, so all of our other views, like our palette up here, are all gonna be zero. They're gonna be closer to the front than our geometry reader with all of the stuff in our document is gonna be closer to the back. And so this simple reordering of views is gonna make this work. So here we go, we have a large image, it's overlapping it, and it still opens our palette editor right here. So this all started when we changed this back to popover from being a sheet, and it looks like it's working great right here. But changing this to popover, is that gonna break our iPhone? No, indeed, let's go take a look. Slow there, and still works, even though it obviously can't show a popover on the iPhone, but still works just fine. All right, so longest demo of the year. Hope you enjoyed that. And your homework that's based on all this is to essentially create this kind of chooser right here that works for Memorize. So you're going to have your themes, your Memorize themes up here chosen from, and when you click, you're gonna play a game based on that theme. And of course, you're going to make it so that your themes are editable with some sort of editor similar to this. You can change things like the color of the theme and the emojis in the theme, that kind of stuff. So you're gonna be doing something quite similar to what we're doing here, but just in Memorize instead. So good luck on that homework, and you know where to find us if you have questions. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.